Good morning. Good morning, everybody. Sometimes I'm yelling on this thing. <laughs> Don't realize it. Moving some things around because I have all these old photos that are hitting the sun. The sun hits differently right now, so we might have to be scooting around. Everybody got your coffee? All right, let's see who's here. Peter, Leisha, Antonio. Wow, you made it, Antonio, to a live. Um, Istanbul, you are Mona. Are you Mona? Paula, good morning. Let me see. Mia is not going to be here. She sent me an email this morning, but she will watch it on the replay. Let me read what you have to say, Antonio. Good morning. Still in Naples. We'll be returning home tomorrow. Um, yeah, Antonio, we're going to talk about this podcast that um, if you search on any podcast platform, the name of the, the show is True Crime Couple, and the couple is, their names are Kaylee and John. So it's on a lot of platforms, Apple, any place you see a podcast there, they don't have a YouTube channel, I don't believe they have an Instagram and they have a Patreon. And I joined their Patreon yesterday. So I want to support these people. Um, I'm going to be working on my loft office this week, Antonio, and I will post more pics of it. Right now, it's just my chair. <laughs> my husband's going to help me assemble the desk. Good morning, Kevin, baby doll, Jamie, Claire, Jenny, Benny, Colleen, Melissa. <clears throat> Let me see if I scroll up here. Lily Benjamin. Okay, Jenny, Benny, you listen to it. So everybody got your coffee? Got your coffee for coffee talk? Let me show you how loaded up I am. <laughs> so here's my coffee. You know, I got my Nespresso maker, so I made that. But there's a little space in that cup, as you can see. So I made myself a little espresso on the side. There's a name for that when you dump an espresso in a coffee. So get ready. I'm going to start talking really fast. <laughs> Tia, good morning. Cindy, good morning. Yes, we're going to do them live this morning. My lighting looks decent. I don't think I need my glasses at this particular moment. So let's jump right in. Who's got your coffee? First of the day, I've been busy. Um, let me make sure. I loaded up a bunch of pictures here. Let me make sure that they are here. Okay. They are there. Uh, all right. Well, I wish, I'm not even going to try to pronounce that. Istanbul, you're Mona, right? Are you Mona? <laughs> you guys with your names, I'm my, my brain works that like, not that great <laughs> all the time. Coffee in hand, Jenny Benny. All right. I'm gonna. Okay. So who listened to you? Listened on a long drive as well, Jamie, and um, somebody else. Jenny said they listened to the. Okay. Oh, on Facebook. Okay. Hi, Antonio. You handsome devil. I wish I knew how to pronounce your name, Istanbul. So I'm going to stick with Istanbul because I do know how to pronounce that. Oh, there's Mona. Okay. All right. So you guys listen to it. So let's just start with like any, I thought they did a really good job. Ooh, ooh, that's intense. I might have to save that blend for like a nice coffee. Um, so yeah, I thought they did a good job. I was going to listen to it the night before, but um, I just, after seeing that the movie, The Zone of Interest, I'm like, I can't handle that right now. Um, so, but then I listened to it on my drive yesterday and um, I thought they handled the story with great tender loving care. And and they they really dove into Cindy's kind of personality, upbringing. I really appreciated that Kaylee um, 
really highlighted that part that I said on one of the shows about, you know, when you lose your mom really young, you lose your compass. And, you know, that's, that's a part of the story of us losing our compass. Um, why, thank you, Antonio, for the compliment. Um, you know, the other, the other part, which I'll go into more in the book, and people are hesitant to talk about this part because it's really my story to tell and it's not really verified, factual and stuff, but it's the abuse part, you know, that we, you know, we did lose our mom and we lost our compass with that, but then enter an abusive step parent that went on for, you know, many years at still a very vulnerable time. And so it was like, whatever we had left was beaten out of us, basically, you know, an abusive step parent that, you know, we had lost our mom, but then she came in and tried to erase our mom. So it was a double down on that situation. So, you know, we were kind of doomed in that, in that respect. And that, you know, when you have that going on and then the remaining parent, your biological parent isn't stepping in, you know, it, it just leads you to be babes in the woods, trying to find your way out. And I think that is a huge part of um, what happened to Cindy. I'm going to start highlighting some of these comments. I forget I can do that. They were very sensitive and without judgment. Yeah, because people, when they look at this story, and this is the driving force of me, you know, one of the driving forces of me writing the book. If you're just to look at Cindy's story on the surface, she looks foolish. She looks reckless and, um, you know, playing with fire and those kind of things. And, and those are true things. But there's a story behind that. You know, what gets a person? It was interesting they mentioned Dirty John because I had some feelings about that, that podcast. Because, you know, there was a history in that family of totally discounting family members over male interlopers, strangers. There was another homicide in that family and they took the man's side. Her mother did in that. So she was very well groomed to overlook, you know, any females and their um, agency. Anyway, that's a, that could be a whole other show. But um, I couldn't stop thinking about how gut-wrenching for you to take that flight. Yeah. Yeah, Jamie, my book starts with a description of me on that plane. And, um, you know, it was so poignant that I was just there, you know, in that sitting in a plane on that exact tarmac that I sat on that day that, you know, I was just desperately trying to figure out what to do and should I leave and should I stay? And I, I have to credit Marge for that because she's the one that said, get on the plane. And, you know, she wasn't a very emotionally evolved person, but she was a very rational person. And that was a very rational decision was, you know, she said, if she's just run off with Mark, she's doing something reckless and, you know, you're going to miss, it's not worth you missing Christmas over that decision. And if something bad has happened, we don't want you out there by yourself. So either way, get on the plane. And, you know, I kept, um, I kept thinking she was going to meet me at the airport. You know, it wasn't really until that door closed that I realized she's not getting on the plane. Some things that they missed I'm not saying they missed things. It's just such an involved, long, complicated story that you couldn't possibly put it all in. But, you know, some pieces of the story that are um, interesting, I think. Um, and I mean, there were some little details that were wrong, but she was very nice, you guys. She um, contacted me before it was launched. I wouldn't have even known about it um, if she hadn't done that. And you know, we had an exchange. I don't know if you caught that. She offered to give me half their proceeds. And it's not a lot of money they're making off this. And she offered to either give it to me toward expenses of writing my book or donate it in Cindy's name to a charity. I mean, that gesture really touched my heart. And I declined that simply because people deserve to make their money. And they put a lot of research into this show. I know they did. 
from what, because I, I'm hearing it like, oh, you got that from that place. You got that from that, that place. But they also had to pay for records. Um, I'm sure they had to pay for them at this point. And because um, they got, you know, public records on it that they pulled some things. So they, they did, a, they put a lot of work into this. This wasn't just a surface thing whatsoever. Um, so, yeah, I, I really appreciated that gesture. And then when I responded to that, and because they asked, you know, how they could promote my book through the podcast and that sort of thing. And I'm like, oh, I've only been working on it for nine years. <laughs> it's not out there yet. But they said, we'll put their blog on it. I told them about this YouTube channel. They didn't know about that. So they promoted that. Um, then, so we went back and forth a little bit. And then she said, when you listen to the podcast, if there's anything that you want corrected, we'll correct it. I mean, nobody does that. <laughs> you know, it's like once it's out there, it's launched, it's out there. There is not anything um, that I would do say that that's worth like, oh, you have to correct this. There wasn't anything. They were these were very minor minor details and and things that like enhance the story, but it doesn't really doesn't matter. It really doesn't matter. Those things. They got the essence of the story. The primary thing was that they got Cindy's essence correct and um, that she was a victim. She walked into a trap. She walked right into it. And the piece that, you know, you're going to read about in the book is all of her journal entries that I have where it shows her struggle of knowing something's not right and she can't pull herself out of it. And she keeps pretending and she can't figure out what's up, what's down, if she can trust herself, if she can trust him. I mean, she is just agonizing over this stuff with herself in her journal and that it's important to look at that because it, you can see how that vulnerability of that being off center and, and disconnected from your own, well, we didn't have strong compass to begin with, but then to get disconnected to that, to that degree, and then have somebody come in and just totally take it over is scary. And it's what happened to her and it cost her her life. So hi, Wesley, John Holmes. Anyway, I I think um, supporting these people is a is a great thing. Like I said, I signed up on their Patreon. They have a nice community over there. I mean, they have over a thousand, I think, Patreon subscribers. So people like this channel. I like their style. It's very conversational. You know, I I said um, it reminded me of me talking to my husband, like, oh, I got to tell you this story, or like I'm telling him a movie or something. You know, like I've told him movies like blow by blow. My husband's sitting there bawling. He's hearing it secondhand from me, but it reminded me of that where. Um, you know, it's like she's filling him in on this case and then he's asking questions. Or And I found him to also be very insightful, providing a male perspective and um, in, in a very sensitive way because men um, can sometimes like, oh, what's wrong with this chick? You know, that's a valid response because it's, it's shocking to look at a story where somebody walks right into a snake pit, walks right into danger. And like, especially on the other side of it, when you see how bad that is. So how bad the outcome is. Anyway, so um, Tia says, hang on, I got to do this. Really appreciate they emphasize the, that knowledge about narcissists was not out there at that time. We were all naive to that. That's correct. And we were so naive to so many things. And it was before the internet. It was before cell phones. So, I mean, let me tell you now, I would, if this had happened now, I would have been all over that man online and it would have been headed off at the pass. You know, one thing that they, um, um, Antonio says, I would have walked into that trap like Cindy, possibly romance, love, proclaim monetary success, et cetera. Very appealing. Yeah. And especially if you're kind of in a vulnerable moment of your life. Um, something I want to tell you, let me see. Hang on. I'm going to show some pictures here. Um, let me get these up here. Slides. Um, this is what he looked like when she met him. Let's see if I can make that bigger. All right. That's what he looked like when she met him. He was very handsome. 
And he was six foot seven. In fact, this might be a picture she took of him. He had, it's funny, he had highlights in his hair because um, Anka Dorn, their accomplice, was a hairdresser. And so it was like, this was the 80s. Women weren't even really highlighting their hair yet that much. You know, I remember I started coloring my hair around that time. But, um, you know, this guy, this face, he's handsome. You know, I mean, he looks very different now, but he's handsome. Oh, I should have put a current picture of him from a mugshot. But anyway, um, he was dressed in a tuxedo. He was wearing a black tuxedo dripping in gold. He had pierced ears. I mean, he just looked very European. It was like at the advent of guys getting their ears pierced and stuff like that. But he had the chains and the bracelets and an earring and stuff like that. Um, and he was extremely confident and, you know, very charming. Now, how we met them, a little bit different in the podcast in that our friend, and she, we don't use her name because she doesn't want to be identified with this anymore. She's really tried to distance herself from it. So I respect that in the book, I'm changing her name. Anyway, she had met them the night before these brothers. And um, let me find another picture. I will show you Rudy in a picture, but this, these are their mug shots. Hang on a second. Um, yeah. Our friend had met them the night before and convinced Cindy, like, I mean, I would have looked at this guy and thought he was her type too. She was tall. He was tall. She was always wanting a tall guy. And um, I'm not going to put that on quite yet. And so she arranged for the guys to meet them the next night at Bobby McGee's. Let me show you Bobby McGee's. I found a blog or something that had um, a little article on this from somebody who lived there at the time. And he had this picture of Bobby McGee's. That's where we used to go. When I was filmed for True Conviction, they took us by there and it was already demolished. But yeah, see, it looks like a house, but it was like the hot spot in Mesa. You know, it's disco, dance floor, fantastic happy hour. We went there for happy hour all the time. Great dance floor. It was like a sunken dance floor in the middle. And, you know, disco, full disco. So I will show their um, mug shots, Antonio. Um, oh, you were going to Bobby McGee's regularly, Jamie. Wow. So, you know, isn't that wild to see that picture of it again? And it was yellow. It was like kind of a charming little cottage, but it was a den of iniquity. <laughs> I looked at that parking lot thinking, I mean, make out sessions. I had a parking lot there. You know, it was a pickup place. Everybody was picking everybody up and it was the 80s. You know, everybody's picking everybody up. Oh, okay. There was another Bobby McGee's in Fremont, California. Okay. Got it. So yeah, that was Bobby McGee's. Anyway, so we went there that night and, um, well, I'll just put this back up because I'm talking about him. And the next night they went there, our friend and Cindy went there and Cindy was begging me to come out. And I'm like, oh, I was so not, this was when I was just recovering from that anxiety disorder. And I was really like dialing down the partying and doing other things and yoga and all this stuff, like trying to get my act together. And so I really wasn't going out that much. And um, I'm like, okay, okay. And I got there at like 10, you know, late. And she was already tangled up in him you know, when I got there, but I didn't understand a word he was saying because he was speaking this heavy German accent. And then the friend was supposed to be with Rudy, but he was out on the dance floor with another girl. And so she's pointing him out to me. And so, you know, like, and she's like waving at him. And I'm like, if he's supposed to be there with you, why is he dancing with another chick? But whatever. Um, and he starts blowing kisses at me from the dance floor and winking at me. And I just was like, this is gross. I, this is not a scene I'm comfortable with. They, I'm not into this glitz and glamor of these guys. And I'm really uncomfortable that he's supposed to be there with my friend and he's hitting on me. And so I just, um... <laughs> Wesley, I have a Bobby McGee's cup laying around somewhere. That's funny. I saw on this article, um, there was like a bathtub and I think they serve drinks in a bathtub that said Bobby McGee's on it. Anyway, it was a hot spot, a fantastic happy hour. Like they had really good food and super cheap, cheap drinks and all the food was free. We like ate many, many dinners at Bobby McGee's. 
sandwiches. Remember they had these little roast beef sandwiches and all these veggies and everything. Anyway, so that was that night. That's how it all kicked off. But one thing they didn't go over in the podcast, just simply because there's not enough time to cover every single thing, but these guys had, have, hang on a second, extensive um, criminal histories in Germany. Here they are. That's the three of them. That's Michael on the left. So this is when they got arrested. Looks like his hair is already getting a little darker. And that's Rudy in the middle. And that is Anka Dorn on the right. So those are their, I believe those are their mug shots. I don't know. It might, be, it might be that those are passport photos. I don't know. I'm in possession of those photos. I have so much of their stuff. Yeah, that's them. I, I don't know what those are. They might be passport photos, but I, I have, I mean, I took this picture. I lined them up like that and took that picture. So I'm in possession of those photos. Yeah. So, but you can still see they were not ugly. You know, I mean, Anka Dorn is very, very plain. The other part of it is that there were four of them initially that came to the States and Rudy's wife was one of them. And she was a prostitute and um, extensive um, rap sheet as a prostitute. I'm going to replace their faces with my sister. So here we go. There's my sister. So Anyway, um, let's see if I can make this a little bit bigger. We'll do that side by side. I'm still learning this. So that's what she looked like back then. That's pretty much what she looked like at that time. That's probably like within a year of this happening. So yeah, there were four of them that came to the States. The, the prostitute was the only one with a conscience. She hopped on a plane and hightailed it back to Germany. They came in through Mexico, came up to San Diego, initially landed in San Diego, pulling all kinds of car cons. They're saying they were owned an, an insurance agency. See, they were always referencing insurance called the Mars Insurance Agency, which was Michael, Anka, Rudy, Suzanne, Mars. So they pulled themselves off that is owning this Mars insurance agency. He bought a red Fiero there. They drove that over, I think, sold it somewhere along the way. All this will be in the book, detailed in the book. They met two chicks in um, San Diego, followed them over to Mesa. That's how they end up at Mesa because they had their eyes already on these two women. One or both of them was married. Anyway, that's how they ended up in Mesa was following these two women over because that's when they started hatching their scheme. They were not just grifters trying to, they were conning women, they were stealing from them, they were getting whatever money they could from them, but their goal was to kill a woman. Their goal was to get the life insurance scam and to murder somebody. That was their goal. And I think Suzanne caught wind of that and hightailed it back to Germany. So it ended up being just the three of them I'm in possession of their rap sheets. They have extensive rap sheets in Germany from um, insurance fraud, um, lighting their apartment on fire and um, insurance claim on that, um, several insurance fraud claims, lots of theft. Rudy did time in a German prison for five years for a brutal gang rape of a woman that he participated in and left her for dead outside the outskirts of Dusseldorf, came back and robbed her apartment. Um, Michael was a prostitute at one point. He was arrested for prostitution. So they had, a, and they stole the car that they drove from Germany to the Paris airport that they rented. They rented a BMW, I think, and drove it to the airport and sold it, sold the rental car for cash in the airport parking lot. And so when Suzanne returned from the United States, she got arrested for that rental car theft because there were warrants out on all of them. Um, so these were career criminals, but they were good at it. I mean, they got somebody to buy that car. So, <clears throat> You know, these were not people that were just, 
I, I say these things, and these are important things to recall about them, because you know, 18 years after they're convicted our taxpayers spent $10 million trying to convince a judge that they were intellectually disabled and it worked for Rudy. So yeah, <laughs> that's why I talk a lot about appeals when it comes to murderers, especially death row inmates, because people fight and fight and fight for them on our dime. And these people with these extensive rap sheets, extensive career criminals, that they went all around town convincing um, Jaguar dealers, Rolex watch sellers, um, custom home builders. They signed a contract on a custom home, boat sellers, that they were anything from wealthy businessmen, international bankers, um, professional athletes. They look the part of a professional athlete. You see a nearly seven foot guy walk in place. First thing you think of is that a basketball player. They were professional tennis players. Um, let's see what else they convinced people. They were surfboard. There was a surfboard business they were convincing people. And people just streamed into court one after the other and testified of their encounters because they were easy to remember these guys. Six foot seven, six foot four, I think Rudy was, three or four you know, striking, confident Germans. You don't see a lot of Germans in Arizona. And um, so they were easily remembered. And when this hit the papers, uh, people crawled out of the woodwork. You know, they were saying that like Cindy knew that they kind of had these commanding presence with women. She didn't know that. I mean, she was suspicious of what he was doing, but she thought he had married her and that he loved her. And I mean, yeah, it's, it's hard to believe, but she did think that. And um, I mean, I know that because I know that from her own mouth. And he was very good at convincing her of that. But women came out of the woodwork who they were romancing, asking to marry the first night, um, stealing money from their wallets, stealing jewelry from their homes. Um, one woman said, you know, Michael, she, Cindy would be at work and he was out, you know, cruising because they were looking for their next victim. I mean, they already had Cindy lined up, but this is how they were going to, they already had the life insurance pre-spent and they were working on the next ones. So the next lineup of victims, this, this is just how they were going to live their life. Meet American women, marry them, take out like big life insurance policies and kill them. That was their plan. And she was their first victim. So all kinds of other women came forward. Um, I'm sure there's many out there that didn't come forward because they're embarrassed or they're married or whatever. But two women who were married came to court and had to testify. And both of those women, I think they pulled the same scam on that um, the other one had died. So they were sitting in some uh, place. One of them, it was the lobby of the Holiday Inn. And one of the women was sitting with Rudy, I believe, at that point, and some woman walked up and delivered him a telegram. Again, this is before electronics or anything. There's telegrams and snail mail and stuff like that. And this woman walks up to Rudy and delivers a telegram. And he says, I can't read it. She's got her two kids in the car. And in front of the kids, because he's like, let's get in the car and read it to me. And it's a telegram saying that his brother, which would be Michael, has been killed in a car accident. And he's freaking out in the car and she's reading this to him. The kids are, little kids are in the back seat saying, mommy, what is died? Anyway, he conned about, out of this married woman who didn't have any money, he conned about $3,000 out of her partially on this um, scam of that his brother was killed in a car accident and he needed funds to go to Florida or some crap. Or, I mean, these just were extensive cons. So they, they pulled this on two different women. They pulled it one with Rudy that Michael had died and they pulled it with another woman, Michael saying that Rudy had died. And so getting these women to feel sorry for them and they can't access their money because, you know, they're out of the country and they, you know, blah, blah, blah. And so women are just handing them money. So, yeah, they pulled those two cons. I mean, these were sophisticated, sophisticated con men. It was mostly women that they were um, conning. But, you know, a lot of these men were, you know, I mean, people don't sell Jaguars without some degree of savvy. 
like they don't let anybody walk in there and test drive one of their cars and hand them the keys. And, um, you know, they test drove Jaguars. They had ordered like three cars, one for each of them. They had already put in like contracts on these cars to order them. Um, Jaguars, BMW, Mercedes, all the high end car dealers in Scottsdale, Phoenix, they were traveling around test driving cars. And so these people were coming forward and testifying about, yeah, well, they told me they were a professional basketball player. Or, yeah. They told me they were in the surfboard business or this or that. And um, anyway, we, I've been around and around this because, because get this, it was argued in the intellectual disability appeal that they were like really trying to say that they were disabled intellectually, like people with Down syndrome. They were arguing that, um, that these were indicators of their low functioning because only a really low functioning person could think they could get away with that. That was argued with a straight face. We had to sit there in court and listen to that bullshit. That the most preposterous things that they did it, it was not argued that they actually succeeded and got away with conning these things. It's just that it's a sign that they're, they're so dumb to even think they could get away with that. Yeah. Our taxpayer dollars, millions of our taxpayer dollars have gone to these arguments to get these um, people off death row. And it worked for Rudy, but that sucks to be him because he's dead. Now he died in general population of natural causes. So bye-bye. Yeah. Last time I saw him, I had to see him over Zoom. I think it was during COVID at a parole hearing that I had to speak at. He was trying to apologize to me and all this crap, but still at the same time claiming he didn't do it. So anyway, yeah. Calculated man manipulation is not low functioning. Yeah. So yeah, doesn't that argument apply for the majority of convicted criminals? So weird. Yeah, like if you have the audacity to think that you could get away with it, then you must be intellectually disabled. Therefore, it's all about the death penalty because, you know, we cannot execute the truly intellectually disabled. And our case was used sort of as a test case for that because literally right after that ruling was made, the op were like, boom, right at the top of the list to test that. And in the podcast, it just talked about Rudy, that being argued for Rudy. Oh, no, it was argued for both of them. Michael, too. It was just that that judge, who, Sylvia Ariano, who came out of retirement to hear that case, um, wanted to take somebody off death row. And she took Rudy off death row. And that was that. So, yeah, this is going to be all detailed in my book. So, anyway. Um, I'm just going on all kinds of tangents here, but let me see. I got some other pictures to show you. Starting to get caffeinated guys. Let's see. I'm going to show you some pictures of, all right, this is kind of a cool picture. Hang on. That was from the newspaper. That's Cindy with our mother. And um, that was before our mother dyed her hair blonde. But that's our mother. And um, Cindy was crying because she was, uh, I, I remember this day. She saw a little, it was an Easter, um, Easter egg hunt in, on the beach in probably Gulf Breeze. And Cindy saw a little plastic toy telephone that was sticking out of the sand and she was running for it. And a boy got there before her and she ran back to our mother was crying. And a local photographer took that picture of her. And that picture was in the newspaper. So, yeah. There's that. Let's see. I just uploaded a bunch of pictures this morning. Hang on. You can see that Cindy and me 
let me make myself a little smaller. There we go. Um, in little matching dresses, I have those dresses. I, I have I have them somewhere. Um, I used to have one hanging on the wall. And you can see how our mother like always had us so, I mean, in our little matching shoes and mat we were always in like matching clothes. We were kind of treated like twins uh, because we were so close in age. We were only 14 months apart. And yes, our mother was tall and Cindy was tall, probably about five, nine, I think. And um, yeah, so that I thought that was a cute picture of us as kids. And um, let me see what else I got here. Oh. There's Cindy. She just had the same face. I mean, she had, let me show you this. My sister, <laughs> let me see if you can see this. She had the same face. I used to carry this picture around in my, in my wallet because I would show people. She had the same face, hang on, when she was a baby. That's her one day old picture. And it's the same freaking face. Like her face just never changed. Yeah, I used to show people like, guess who this is? And people would look at it and be like, that's your sister. <laughs> it was her one day old picture. Yeah. So there she is. I have that picture too. There were of all three of us. But you can kind of see how our mother and Cindy and I were in kind of matching dresses in that photo shoot. Let's see. I put some other ones of. Um, hang on. I did that one. Let's see. Not quite sure what this one is. Oh, this is a picture I took of her with, um, that was my cat at the time, but that's a cute picture of her. That was probably when she was like early 20s. Let's see. Here's a good picture of her. That was like, again, probably within the year. Yes, Wesley, it is, it is both painful and therapeutic. And there's a part of me that doesn't want to stop writing it, <laughs> but I need to, because I need to move on to something else. Let me see what else I got here. Um, this right here is a very poignant picture to me because this was taken probably the year after we lost our mother and everybody gives kids who lose their mother stuff, you know, and um, to help with that. And I'm sure somebody gave us these little ballerina tutus and the matching little head things. And look how sad Cindy looks there. And look at my posture. And this was when my dad started cutting our hair. <laughs> you lose your mom and your dad takes over and it's a different world. So yeah, our dad had started cutting our hair and there's some pictures where it's just freaking butchered. But um, yeah, this was when we had moved. So this is probably a year after we lost our mom, but yeah, you can see um, it's a very poignant picture because you can see how sad we are. And somebody thought too, thought that was a good picture probably because they were sending it probably to the person who bought us the, the um, two twos. Let me see what else I got here. And here we are grown up in the 80s. Hang on. Why is that not? Oh, let me get rid of that. Hang on. I'm still learning how to do this picture thing. I'm going to show you a picture of us in the 80s. <laughs> this was at a, um, 
Neil is trying to come up at a Christmas party. So we're moving some of these from the studio. Yeah, so we we were five and seven. It was two weeks before my sixth birthday that we lost our mom. Shoot, I really wanted to show this one. It's not coming up for some reason. I'll put this one back up. I don't know why that other one's not coming up. Let me get rid of it and see if I can try it again. Um, yeah, just kind of a cool picture of us in the 80s. So, yeah. I don't know why that's not coming up. This picture, oh, this is kind of a funny one. I didn't put this, but I'll show you here. This picture here is kind of quintessential us because, here you go. Uh, it's backwards. Um, she insisted that we dress up as these, she had a name for it, these Santa's elves. And this was probably like 1986 or seven. And um, we had the red tights and everything. I made, I still have my skirt. I made those skirts and we made cookies and we went all around town um, delivering cookies to our friends and guys we had crushes on. <laughs> so that was a picture of us then. Anyway, I got a ton of pictures. I wanted to show you that one red one. Oh my God, this is a Bobby McGee's, I think. No, that's my binders. Anyway, there's a lot more there, but yeah, we, we wore a lot of matching things. Let me see. That one's not coming up. I really tried to get these. Yeah, we did a lot of crazy matching stuff. We were known around with our friends as, uh, it, he called it, our friend Neil called it the Monkman Sister Syndrome. Because, I don't know, we just had a vibe, you know. We just had a freaking vibe about us that people responded to. And we always, like, attracted guys when we were together and stuff. So, shoot. I wanted to be able to show this one, but it doesn't look like it's going to come up. I don't know why that's being difficult. Anyway, I'll just put this one back up. I don't know why this is acting this way. Well, there's Cindy. Okay, we'll leave that like that. So anyway, there she is. So that was probably how she looked. You know, one thing they, they didn't mention in the podcast, you know, their alibi that night was they went to Bobby McGee's back to Bobby McGee's and they went there for dinner and used Cindy's credit card to have a celebratory dinner and drinks after killing her and um, told the waitress, like we're waiting for, we're waiting for her, like trying to establish an alibi that they were sitting there at their table waiting for her. They wanted a table for four and, you know, trying to establish that they were waiting for somebody after they had murdered her and um, cleaned themselves up. And, Finally, they said to the, Michael said to the waitress who testified to this in court that, um, oh, we'll go ahead and order because um, she doesn't need to eat anyway. She's too fat. My sister was 5'9", and I think at her death weighed like 135 pounds. Yeah, she was never fat. So, yeah. These were um, disgusting human beings. And um, exactly where they need to be. You know, another thing that, that, you know, like I said, they can't cover everything in the podcast. Another thing that you'll read in my book is about how they tried to do a copycat murder from jail. They also haven't had an escape attempt from jail. Or at least escape plan. But yeah, they tried to do a copycat murder where uh, another inmate came forward and he didn't have any um, deal to tell this, but he was just scared that they were going to succeed with it. That, um, that Michael had approached him, another inmate, cause they were in solitary. It was back, you know, during the, during the, you know, 
high time of AIDS. And because of his history as a male prostitute, he was like on some sort of AIDS isolation or something in the jail. It had something to do with that. And there was another guy who was a drug addict who was in this same like isolation unit with him and said that he told him and even drew him a map and he showed the map to, um, to the detectives or probably Kathy Hughes, you know, they brought him in. I have his whole statement about how Michael was going to, he still, he managed to get the insurance papers into the jail hidden in his cell. That's how attached he was to those insurance documents. So he had them in jail and would flash them around at other inmates and said that he was still, you know, believing he was going to get the 400,000. That was the total they were going to get was 400,000 out of two policies and he was going to pay him to go and do a copycat murder. And so if it had to be a copycat, he had to know the details of what happened, right? So he drew this guy a map to the area and told him the details of what to do. And he was writing Rudy um, notes in jail that, um, you know, they're going to get out soon. Don't do anything stupid. We're going to, I got, I, he said, I have somebody who's going to play the game again. That's what he called it, play the game again. And so that all came out in the trial. That also was probably something that was argued in the appeal of him being intellectually disabled because only somebody who's intellectually disabled could come up with such a stupid uh, plan. I mean, everything was just twisted, twisted, twisted. So, yeah, they used the mentally deficient approach on everything. You know, anything that was absurdly, you know, out of the norm that a sociopath is going to do out of the norm. And they get away with a lot of it, you know, is, was, was twisted around and they were called, you know, intellectually disabled. And it worked for one of them, worked for Rudy. But, you know, the good thing about that was, and they did cover this in the podcast, is that when I confronted them to their face in my victim impact statement in court, um, I said, there's only one good thing about him being, you being successful with his appeal and him getting off death row is that I know you're going to drop him like a hot potato as soon as he's, as soon as he no longer holds the prestige of a death row inmate. I use the word prestige very deliberately. And that's exactly what they did. So as soon as he was removed from death row, put in general population, he, um, they dropped him. I, they certainly never showed up at a parole hearing because I was at all of them. So nobody ever showed up on his behalf, spoke on his behalf, tried to argue the mentally deficient thing at a parole hearing. None of it. Uh, because they don't care about them. They care about the cause but they act like they care about them. They don't give a shit about these people. Anyway, this is why, uh, do you think the innocent project guilt, guilty people off? 100% they do. I mean, that federal uh, legal defender's office got Rudy Appelt off death row and he's guilty of sin. He was guilty of sin. He's dead now. Absolutely they do. So I, I don't follow them. I know Roberta Glass um, speaks out about that and I need to tune into her stuff. It's just having lived through it, having lived through it for so many years, having been chewed up and spit out by these people that champion for murderers. I have a low tolerance for this shit, you know, but I will speak out about it just simply because they have this, you know, aura. They sort of sell themselves like Josh fucking Dubin. They sell themselves as they're the do-gooders out in the world. Oh, no, you are not a do-gooder if you were attacking somebody like Ruth Markell. You are not, and I'm not saying that's happened to her, but it would if it, if death penalty was on the table of an Athey's Adelson's. It's happened to me. And you are not a do-gooder if you're going after victims' families. You're not. You're on the wrong side of the team, man. You are on the wrong side of that fence. And, 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 it's not like they're doing it pro bono. They're making bank off of this, you guys. They are making a lot of money and they got long-term clients because if they're in death row, they're in there for the rest of their lives. They're in, do you know it's like a 3% chance of anybody ever getting executed on death row? 
So you got a long-term client. Most people like the Adelsons are going to be, you know, short term for rash bomb. You know, he, he'll do these cases, then it'll be over. He'll have to find other wealthy people, uh, well, other wealthy murderers to champion. But a death row appellate attorney has decades and guess who's paying their bills? We are. <laughs> so yeah, it's a money machine. Yeah, I saw that about Dubin's guy. <clears throat> anyway, yeah, I haven't followed the Innocence Project much either, but I, I just know people of that ilk and, and what they've, the, the, the treatment they've given me and my family. Yes, my book will be finished this year sometime. Yes, it will. I'm as Antonio reminded me, I'm setting up this week my office space upstairs. I have literally gotten on a plane and gone to Seattle area to write it for the last nine years, and I'm gonna finish it here at this house. So yes. Seemed to be something else I was gonna say. Well, some other things about our case, um, just to sort sort of, well, does anybody have any questions, you know, that listen to the podcast and before I kind of go off on my, yeah, Dubin is a slime bag. Wesley, you know how he approached me in the courtroom. Did you catch that story, Wesley, of how Josh Dubin approached me in the courtroom? I'll tell it just because I want to tell on him. Um, so... I was sitting there alone in the courtroom with this very, not this, my small laptop open. And there was some issue, and I think I know who it was, it was a local attorney of taking some pictures in the courtroom and posting them somewhere. And these guys, those those uh, jury selection guys were all over the internet, all over social media. They were so freaking intense, you guys. I mean, the, the intensity was so strong in that courtroom. And um, when they were in there, when they left, it kind of sucked all out with them. And they were very intense. <laughs> Tense guys. Anyway, so I'm sitting in there alone, and that pipsqueak, Josh Dubin, that small man, I'm gonna call him that, that that arrogant small man, says to the bailiff, and he's like 10 feet away from me. And I'm the only person sitting there on that side of the courtroom, literally the only person, because I came back early from lunch. And he looks at me and I have my laptop on my lap and I'm probably like on law and crime in their chat, just seeing what people are saying, you know, what's going on. And he looks at me, then he looks at the bailiff and says, Does she, is she recording off that thing? And I look at him like, dude, I'm right here. You could talk to me, you know, like, why are you involving a bailiff in this conversation when like nothing's happening in the courtroom and like, I'm right in front of you. And, and he said, and I said, so I just addressed, I didn't even address the bailiff. I just addressed him directly. I said, Oh, do you mean, do we have a stream? Because there was all kinds of trouble with the stream in the morning. And I thought that's what he was checking is like, is the stream up, but like, he's being a, I want to say the P word <laughs> and like, just not addressing me directly. And he goes, no. And I looked at him and said, Oh, do you mean, is the stream up? And he goes, no, are you recording off that thing? Are you recording us right now? I said, no, I'm not recording anything. And you dumbass, if I was, I'd be recording my own freaking face. It's a front facing camera. It's a laptop. This is not an iPhone. I'm not pointing anything at anybody. It's a freaking laptop with no camera on that side. And somehow he thought I was recording him with my laptop. And then he just sort of like, hmm, the arrogance of this man. But he's, that's why I say dumb Dubin. That's just freaking dumb, you know? And also like, why not just ask me the question? I'm right there. Anyway, I know, <laughs> I drove business. I mean, somebody did record something, I guess, and take a picture and they got real, you know, tight about that. But like, that was just so stupid. I just think he's, he's, he's not as ballsy as he'd like to think he is. If he can't approach me, I'm an old freaking lady, you know? I mean, 
if you can't approach me to my face when like we're literally the only two people in the freaking room and you have to, th you have to enlist a bailiff, please trying to get me arrested or booted out of the courtroom for having my laptop open. I was very, very, very careful about the rules in that courtroom because I've been in other courtrooms where man in the Scott Peterson trial, you would, I saw people get kicked out of the courtroom for being in the back row chewing gum because the judge could see it. He would see people in the back row chewing gum and kick them out of the courtroom. I mean, it was so freaking tight. And so I checked out all the rules before I went in that Tallahassee courtroom, which was so loose. They're looking at me like, what? Like, what are these questions about? Because I'm like, can I bring my laptop? Can I bring my phone? Is there Wi-Fi? You know, what are the rules about this? Can I bring water in? A lot of courtrooms, you can't even bring water in. You know, stuff like that. I'm asking them at the information desk before I went up and they're looking at me like, lady, where do you think you are? You know, at the OJ Simpson trial or something, you know, because I wanted to make sure I had all the rules down before I walked in that courtroom and did something dumb, but I wasn't the dumb one. Dubin was the dumb one in that. I know he's a pompous jerk. I don't think they'll use him again, but who knows? It might be that stupid. Um, let me see some questions. I appreciate when you guys put, um, the red question marks, because that really helps. What was the last convo? I will tell you that. When you curse, it sounds like an invitation to afternoon high tea and towers of delicious small sandwiches. <laughs> oh my God. <laughs> Plus, I love high tea. Come up and go to high tea with me, Antonio. There's a place around here that does it. <laughs> That's so funny. <gasps> warning, warning, old lady cursing. Oh my God, that really made me laugh. Thank you, I did that laugh. Yeah, they blew a million on that idiot. Yeah. <laughs> I, I I try to refrain from cursing around you, Antonio, because I think one time I saw you give somebody a hard time for cursing and I'm like, I can wash my P's and Q's. But you know, it just flies out of my mouth sometimes. Because I think you're a proper gentleman. <laughs> Oh my God. Anyway, I'm trying to be, I'm trying to be good. So the, the last conversation I had with my sister was when we were trying to button up our plans to fly out. I mean, the last real conversation I had with her was when she, and they referenced this in the podcast was when she called to tell me that she had contacted Mark. Oh, I'm going to see that. I uploaded a picture of Mark, her um, ex-boyfriend, Mark Maurer, who also passed last year or the year before of cancer. That's Mark Maurer. So that's what he looked like back then. But he had, his hair was also curlier and longer because it was the 80s, you know, when she was with him. But he, she was also, he was also tall. He was a very big personality. Um, you can see he's handsome there, too. And, you know, he had the, the deep voice. You probably heard him on commercials because he was a voice actor and he's on a lot of big commercials. And um, so, yeah, that's Mark Maurer rest in peace. He went to one of the sentencing with me. We drove out there together and something happened. I think I was driving and we got pulled over by a cop for speeding or something. Cause it was way, we had to go down these country roads to get to Florence. And um, like, we were a little bit late getting there because, you know, I was, I think I was speeding. So yeah, there's Mark Maurer. And he stayed in contact with me over the years. And, you know, Cindy was, I don't think he ever married. And, um, you know, really was one of, you know, the ripple effect of this, you know, devastated by this. And knowing that, you know, 
I mean, the survivor guilt and how it just affects so many people. Like, I mean, he talk to me about that. If he'd only stayed with Cindy, she wouldn't have gotten with him. She, I mean, Michael Appelt was supposed to be her rebound guy and would have been her rebound guy if he wasn't planning to kill her. And yeah, try dating after that. Speaking of myself. Hi, B Rabbit from Australia. Yeah, the Adelsons make us curse like sailors. <laughs> yeah, right. Oh my God. Can't find the red question. I, I think that's like on the iPhone or something. What was the evidence that convinced the murderers? Do you mean convicted? You mean convicted the murderers, JJ Don? Just clarify that and I will. It was a it was very much a circumstantial case. I'll go back to that question when you clarify that. Um, okay, I'll, I'll go back to that here in a second. But did you know that Cindy got married before or did she tell you after? After. So that was a little bit different than how it went in the podcast. So money came up a lot in our conversations because she believed that these guys, that Michael was very wealthy. So she also had like, I mean, there were just so many elements that created a perfect storm. One of them was that she had a retirement investment account that had a life insurance element that I was listed as beneficiary on. So I had totally forgotten about that, but she had, it was some, for some reason out of Tucson. And so, you know, she had a little bit of money in that and probably out of the sale of her condo in Minneapolis. And so um, he convinced her that Rudy and Anka, who was still the family friend whose husband had died in Arizona, all lies. But anyway, he convinced her that they had to get back to Germany. They couldn't access their funds. And so she took money out of that account and gave them, I think it was like $1,800 for them to get their plane tickets to go back to Germany, where she believed they were this whole time. I mean, I, this came up in conversation all the time with her about how Rudy was back in Germany and, you know, how she was going to get reimbursed for that when he, when his money came over and they were checking the mail all the time, there was something about the money or a check coming in the mail. Well, he was checking the mail all the time for the life insurance policy. And to him, that was money, but, you know, little inconvenient step of killing her before they could collect. Anyway, so she had believed that she purchased their plane tickets to go back to Germany. In reality, they were holed up in this cheap motel in Mesa the whole time. So when I, so anyway, she thought they were back in Germany. He convinced her that the only way that they could stay together, that he was going to have to go back to Germany too, because of the visa situation. The only way that they could pursue the relationship would be for him to stay in the States and that for her to marry him. And he had just looped her into all this guilt of, sabotaging his job and his security clearance and all this convoluted crap. Even that's all over her journal. I mean, you can really, I mean, the book is going to be excerpts all through the book of her journal. You can really see what was going through her head and the confusion she was in and the convincing he had done. And so she believed that she was responsible in some way and that she was looking for ways to help. And so this getting married. So even when she's in the hotel in Vegas, and married him, she's writing herself a letter on the stationery of the hotel where she's questioning everything in this letter to herself and literally writes the words and a list of things. Can I trust him? And she's just married him the day before. I mean, it's just sad. It's just so sad. The turmoil, the mental turmoil that she was in, but she did this thinking this was some sort of step of helping him. And like, so she could sort of sort out the relationship because he said, you know, this is urgency. He had to get back to Germany. Unless, you know, if they were married, he could stay there. So when I found out, so anyway, how I found out was she had come back and done that, but it was maybe like a week later or something. I don't remember the timeline, maybe within a couple weeks. And we're on the phone and she's like, hey, because our grandma would come out in the winter and stay with one of the two of us, you know, for a month or so. She said, hey, when grandma comes out this winter, 
Um, just so you know, she's going to stay with me and Michael because he's got plans to get this big house and we'll have plenty of room for her to stay with us. You know, when his money gets here and he's been looking at a house, well, he was looking at a house, you know, to buy, to build with the life insurance money. And so, um, you know, she's telling me all this stuff and like, you know, that they're going to set up this life in this big house that he's going to buy or build or whatever. And in that conversation, I said, now, wait a minute, Cindy, you're not going to marry this guy, are you? I said it like that. And then she just goes silent and said, what would you say if I told you I already had? And I just flew off the handle because I'm like, what, when, how, what freaked me out the most in that conversation was that she had gone to Vegas and back and I didn't know it. My sister, I knew where she was every single day of our lives. The fact that she had gone to the airport, gotten on a plane, flown somewhere, flown back, and I didn't know she had gone somewhere on an airplane completely freaked me out. That freaked me out more than the marriage, actually, at the time. We got in this big blow up on the phone. She's like, she's crying and don't be mad at me. And I'm like, what the hell are you doing? How could you have gone to Vegas and you didn't tell me what's going on? And, um, you know, it was heated and and she was crying on the phone. I remember that. And then I went over either later that day or the next day and we sat at the pool and I saw her and um, she was so upset and she was chain smoking cigarettes and she looked very thin and gaunt and, and said, you know, you can't tell me I don't know what I'm doing and don't tell me what I'm, that I don't know what I'm doing and don't make me feel like I'm stupid cat. She called me Katie. Katie, don't make me feel like I'm stupid, Katie. And, you know, she was crying and my heart just went out to her. And I just said, you're not stupid. We're going to sort this out. Um, you know, and, and said, I'm going to do, I said to her face, I'm going to do my best to accept him. And he's, uh, and we were both crying at the pool. And I said, he's not going to come between us, Cindy. He's not going to drive a wedge between us because he had been doing that. That on the podcast, the husband said that, that he immediately started separating her out, including from me. So that November, that was like, that conversation was like late October, maybe early November. My birthday was November 6th. And she would have always done something for my birthday. And she swung by my house and dropped off cupcakes while he was sitting in the driveway with the car idling. I mean, that's so unheard of, you know, she would have come in and we would have hung out and like had a cupcake, whatever. But like, that's the amount of time that she was allotted uh, to have for me was that they also another. So anyway, that's how I found out about it. Another thing that was a little incorrect in the podcast was they did do a hard launch of the marriage, but they did it at a party and they called it December fest. And they had people, they threw a party and it was like a German uh, themed party, like Oktoberfest, but it was December Fest. It was at the clubhouse of her apartment complex. And I think he must have been feeling the pressure because she was like, I need to let people know. I, I don't feel right. People not knowing. She made me lie and pretend like I didn't know because she was scared because he was so pressuring her. Don't tell anybody. Don't tell anybody. And everything was blamed on German customs. You know, this is the cultural difference. The customs are different. He doesn't want people to know yet. He wants it to be done in their way that they do it and all this. So you can't let him know. And when she and I would be on the phone and he came in the room, she would hit the buttons, you know, on the landline. So it would go beep, beep to alert me that she's going to be answering differently because she doesn't want him to hear her answers on the phone. So, I mean, that's how we communicate. I just kept thinking, okay, this is going to run its course. This guy's an asshole. Um, and he's going to break her heart and we're going to be all there to pick up the pieces. You do not think of the, we did not think back then of the level of danger that she was in. You think the, the most dangerous thing is there's going to be another broken heart and he's probably going to take advantage of her for a green card. And that's the worst case scenario. That's what we all thought, you know, like, okay, well, we're going to let this run its course, you know? So when I heard her, when she called me and told me that she had contacted Mark and had this conversation and admitted to him that she'd gotten married, admitted to him that she still loved him. And, you know, he was coming over for Christmas, all this they covered in the podcast. When she told me that I was relieved because it's like, I'll take my Mark over this asshole any day. You know, Mark's a known entity and, 
you know, did, they didn't mention the podcast that Michael Appelt was in my home for Thanksgiving dinner that year. They came over for Thanksgiving dinner. This will be this scene is in the book and, you know, intimate friends were there, maybe seven or eight of us. And we had our Thanksgiving dinner and then we like piled all over the floor and the sofas to watch E.T. And she started crying in the movie E.T. And he start he doesn't even know anybody. I and mean, he's meeting some of the people for the first time. And he starts just giving her all kinds of shit, you know, making fun of her. You big cry, baby, laughing at her because she's crying at the movie E.T. And we're all sitting there like, what the fuck? You know, and I mean, he was this big bully. And and you might think that you would. I mean, it was my own home. Probably the person I am now, I would have gotten in his face. But, you know, I was 29 years old and like, what the hell's going on? And she gets up and runs to the bathroom and he followed her. So I thought, OK, well, he's, you know, he's going to apologize. He's going to make nice. And we talked about it the next day. And I'm like, what was that all about? And um, she said, yeah, well, I said, well, at least he followed you. He must have apologized. And she goes, no, Kathy, he just followed me in there to give me more shit. Yeah. So. Anyway, <clears throat> those are just some things that led up to it. And um, yeah, they didn't tell the part where I had a connecting flight when I was headed home that Christmas Eve day. And I got off the plane for my connecting flight to hear my name paged on, in the airport. Kathy Monkman called the airport, pick up a red phone, airport police. I'm like, what the fuck? And so I go to this red phone and like plastered myself against the wall. And it's the Mesa police calling me. And, um, you know, where are you? Cause they had my ticket because they had her ticket. Cause I left her ticket on my kitchen counter and thinking she's going to, she had key, thinking she had keys, a key to my house and that she could get in there and she'd get her ticket and she'd make meet me at the airport. I mean, these are just irrational decisions you're making on the fly. And so they knew my schedule and, um, you know, they're asking me a million questions. Why did you leave? And, you know, where is she? And, you know, I was thinking they're calling me because she turned up, you know, and, um, later I come to find out he immediate was immediately was throwing suspicion at me. So they thought I was fleeing. They thought that I had done something to her and I was fleeing. Because he, Michael Appel, immediately started throwing suspicion at me because he had been digging through all of her papers and he knew about that investment account she had with the life insurance thing and that I was listed as beneficiary on that. And he told them that she had a million dollars of life insurance on me, throwing me under the bus. In reality, I think it was 10000 maybe 12000 I got out of that. And uh, it allowed me to take a summer off and go to massage school, that money. But um, yeah, he, he always had life insurance on his mind. So when the police, like four days later, said, we need to interview you in person. And I flew back from Illinois to Mesa for one day. I didn't even spend the night. I didn't go by my house, nothing. They were still on the loose, these guys. It was before they came back for the funeral. They were living in her apartment, pawning her jewelry, taking possession of her stuff, driving her car. Um, part of the reason they brought me back and wanted to question me face to face. And I was fine with it because I'm like, I have to impart on these detectives that these guys are involved because she believed, how do you tell somebody what somebody else believed? And here there being suspicions being thrown on me. So I'm sort of a person of interest, unbeknownst to me, completely unbeknownst to me. And so I'm thinking, no, they want me, they want me to help them. And so I'm flying back. Like you have to understand Cindy believed that Rudy and Anka were in Germany this whole time, which was Michael's alibi. So that was huge piece of the puzzle for me that if they've been in town the whole time, these guys are lying something. And I kept saying she gave them money to fly back. They hired somebody with that money. I couldn't fathom that they did it themselves. I was so freaking shocked when I found out they did it themselves. <sighs> anyway, I'm going off on a lot of tangents here, but 
get off of my screen. Something is blocking my screen. There. Anyway, I'm going to pause and look at some comments to see what. Yeah, everything was a total manipulation. Stories and excuses for everything. Yes, he did. Yeah, so the story with Mark's ex was when Cindy was breaking up with him, she confessed this thing to me. And it's the kind of thing that you're not going to tell anybody until you want insurance that you're not going to go back with the person. So like, I'm going to tell you this because I know it's going to freak you out. And if I ever have a weak moment to go back with him, you know, throw this in my face type of thing. So she told me that Mark had a baby mama and um, her name was Shannon. I may even remember her name that... I think she was a nurse and she was called home about her kid and said, you need to come home right away. Like her kid was sick or something where she just like left work and said, I need to get home right now. Got some phone call and went home and she was found still with her coat on and her purse over her shoulder, having been shot up and down her back. So somebody was laying in wait in her house and set that whole thing up. And Mark was considered a suspect for that. And it was never solved. But when I heard the whole details of the story, it was very obvious that it was, she was married or had a boyfriend. It was that person. They just weren't held accountable. But Mark was completely, totally, 100% innocent in that and released and everything like that. But I mean, lightning struck twice in that man's life. I mean, terrible. And I felt so bad because he was calling me when she was still missing. And then after she was found, because they were hounding him and they were over in LA following him and interviewing him and getting samples from him and all this kind of stuff. And he's calling me like, what the hell's going on, Kathy? I mean, I have a answering machine message from him where he sounded very stern because here I'm like pointing suspicion at him. And, you know, I had to apologize to him later and he was understood. He was like, I just wanted them off my ass to, to find the people who did this. But yeah, so freaking complicated. Let's see. Yeah, that's true. They could have harmed you too if they'd stolen your flat keys without Cindy's knowledge. Well, they did have her keys. So when she went missing, she didn't have her purse or her keys. And so their story never really made sense. That, but... When he's telling us that night that she's missing, that she got a phone call. For, he was in the shower. She got a phone call. I think he first said he answered the phone because he heard the angry man. And then, then he got in the shower. I think that's what it went down. That he answered the phone. It was an angry man. He puts him on the line with Cindy. He jumps in the shower. Cindy comes into the bathroom. Something happened in the bathroom because that's such a piece of his story. And there's a grain of truth to every liar story. And her beach towel was found with her body at the scene. Something happened in the, sh in the bathroom. I mean, we we'll never know how it went down and all the details of it and whatever. And I don't really want to know, but I think something did happen in the bathroom anyway. So he said that, and then she just ran out of the house. Well, I'm thinking that's got to be Mark because literally the day before she's telling me Mark's coming in for the holidays. You know, he was upset with me. I'm thinking, oh my God, he stopped at the office uh, pay phone and he's calling her. He, I don't think he even knew her exact apartment number because I don't think she lived in that apartment when she was dating him. I don't know. But like, I'm thinking she's ran out of the apartment to like head him off at the pass. So he doesn't show up at the door and there's a big scene and she just ran out and then he just scooped her up and they're like holed up in some motel room. So anyway, um, that was what I was clinging to because it was the best, it was the better story than the one that was real. Melanie, the name of the podcast is True Crime Couple, and I have it linked. Uh, I'll link it under this video, but I have it linked under my latest video. Yeah, True Crime Couple, and it's their latest episode. 
Yeah, that's exactly. I don't know, Jennifer, if that's exactly what he wanted me to think, because he didn't know about the phone call with Mark. I mean, it was just a lot of weird coincidences that went in his favor, not the least of which she had that investment account that had a life insurance component. So when he was telling her that he they had to get the life insurance, she had it all woven into because he had woven this into this story that he was, you know, and he was an international banker, right? That he's moving his funds over to the United States. In order to do that, he had to set up an account here that had a life insurance component attached to it. And they had to complete all that before the funds could get transferred. See how that makes sense? So for her, the life insurance was a means to, for him to get the funds, the account open for the funds to get transferred. So every single day I talked to her was, um, yeah, we checked the mail today and the check didn't come or or this and that, like this obsessive checking the mail, thinking that the his money was coming. But in reality, he's checking the mail to see that the, and I mean, the life insurance policy went into effect on the 22nd and they killed her on the 23rd. I mean, there was just a lot of bizarre coincidences that they got away with, you know, helped them get away with it. So the other thing that they didn't cover in the podcast, a little detail is that um, they conned a $3,000 loan out of my bank. So between the time they killed her and the time they were arrested was about a week, a little over maybe 10 days. They walked into my bank branch, which was also her bank, Valley National Bank, demanded a loan for $3,000 with the branch manager and said, no collateral, no jobs, no money, no residency. And said, but, you know, this was at that point, a high profile in the media um, and said, if you don't give us this money, and using they they tried to use the life insurance as collateral. The police had frozen her accounts at this point. So that was already happening at the bank. Yet they were able to successfully con a $3,000 loan saying, if you don't give us this loan, we're going to the media and saying this poor widower can't even go to his own wife's funeral because you won't give us a loan. And they gave them a loan. This is how successful they were at con, you cannot con a bank manager. It was my bank, and I I went through a rough patch around that time and tried to get a loan to cover some oh, whatever bills or whatever I had. I couldn't even get a loan at my own bank that I had an account at, and they got three thousand dollars. So they took that three thousand dollars, flew to the funeral, showed up at the funeral met with my dad and Marge and believe it or not, my dad's BFF, you know, the singer, Alison Krauss, it's her dad, Fred Krauss spoke German. I mean, I grew up with the Krauss family, Alison and Victor, who are super famous now musicians. We grew up together and their dad, Fred, it's my dad's like best friend spoke German and he went with them and interpreted. One of them wore my dad's suit jacket they came to the funeral, spoke at the funeral, but I walked up to them and I went late because I was like, at that point, I was like so impressing upon the police. It's them. It's them. I don't think they did it themselves. I think they hired somebody with that money Cindy gave them, but it's them. And the police told us we have another viable suspect. There was a hitchhiker in the area. Um, we're you know, leaning against them. And it was so frustrating to me because it was so obvious that it was them. And we had to deal with them at the funeral. And, you know, my dad's like, should we invite them over? I'm like, hell no, dad. I'll apologize. I'll take the hit for the family. They are not crossing the threshold of our home. No, they are not coming. That asshole had the audacity to sit up in court on a witness stand and bitch about how our family was not kind to them at the funeral because we didn't invite them over for the after gathering. He wore my dad's fucking suit jacket at the funeral and Marge pressed the clothes of the other one. Yeah. I mean, the audacity of sociopaths. We see that kind of bravado with the Adelsons too. Um, so they do did that. 
came to the grave site and everything. And then I passed, I testified to this. I passed them on the highway coming back from the grave site. And I saw the two, the two brothers were in the front seat and she was in the back seat, which that, that whole configuration tells a lot, doesn't it? Anka Dorn, just the tag along. And um, they were laughing as I passed them, as we passed them on the highway. That was the last time I saw them other than in court. Because they then flew back the next day. Well, she claimed that it was that night. Of course, they had to go out dancing the night at the funeral. They had to go out and whoop it up. And um, she claimed that that was the night that she they confessed to her that they murdered Cindy. Like, oh, please, Anka. <laughs> like, like she didn't know all along. Yeah, she, she just was trying to protect herself as much as she could. But that was her testimony. And that they said that night that when Cindy signed the life insurance policy, she signed her death warrant. Warrant. And once again, they're celebrating because they're thinking they're going back and collecting on the life insurance, which they were calling like the next day. So they get back, take a cab to her apartment, spend the night, call the same cab driver the next morning, take a cab back to the airport, buy three plane tickets. This was another era. You could buy plane tickets under false names. You didn't even have to show an ID. They bought three under Smith something, very generic names. The three of them flew to L.A., went to downtown LA, sat in a cafe while Anka translated with her dictionary. The They played it on the podcast, the Hear What I Have to Talk recording, paid a homeless man to read this into a phone, hopped on a plane, flew back to Phoenix, called the same cab driver who testified, went back to Cindy's apartment, made sure that the recording had landed on the answering machine, called the police and said, we're being threatened. Hear what I have to talk. And um, so as soon as they hear that, the German speaking detective is like, this is poorly translated German to English. So now they know. And they've got them on a SCAT team, which is like, um, I don't remember what, S-C-A-T. Um, they have people literally in the bushes and in a van in the parking lot, you know, covering now covering the house, you know, and so, you know, watching their every move. And so they, you know, they all came and testified all these, whatever officers from that team, they get back to her place, um, call the police. And then they, they say, well, come on in. We want to, um, hear this recording. And, you know, so they bring them in. Is that when they bring them in? No, they, that's when they send the SCAD team out and now they're watching them, their every move, and they haven't seen them move like the next day. They haven't seen them leave the apartment. So they are thinking, are they still in there? So they send a plain clothes officer to the door who just pretends like he's at the wrong door, like I'm looking for Jose or something like that. And they're like, no, you're at the wrong place. So they just wanted to make sure that they were still in there. And he was able to peek in and see one of the brothers. The second he leaves, they have Anka call the detective at the police station saying two black men with sunglasses and briefcases um, just showed up at the door and threatened us. Which, of course, they know isn't true because they have them under visual surveillance and there were no black men walking around the apartment complex of that description. But they decided to parlay that like person that, you know, just accidentally walked up to the wrong door, which was, you know, a cop, but anyway, into part of their story. So now they know, you know, okay, we got to bring them in. So they, they call them in saying, we're going to release your passports. We have, a, we want to talk to you about, we have a good suspect now. And, you know, they just totally, I think they might've picked them up and brought them over because her car was, they were driving her car at that point, but her car was at the apartment. And uh, when they released it to me, and so they bring them in and immediately split up the brothers in different interrogation rooms and put Anka Dorn in the hall behind a two way mirror and make her sit there for like three hours while they're, you know, hammering them. Cause at that point they know that they did it, but they know somebody's, they got to get somebody to crack. And they knew the weakest link was Anka and Mark Jones just kept watching her, watching her, watching her for like three hours. And he said, you know, I've talked to him at length about this. He knew the moment to like snap her up and throw her into an interrogation room and said, you start talking now or you're going to death row with the other ones. Cause we know you guys did this. And she cracked. Yeah. Right. Jamie, it's always the black guy. 
Yeah. So anyway, that's how they got arrested. They never seen the light of day since. So let me, I am going to go back and see what comments I may have missed. Try some glasses. Yeah, this is just filling in some blanks, uh, La Mesa, to the podcast. I think the lessons in hindsight is that scammers know all the loopholes. Women, be careful. Trust your instincts. Yep, they do know all of the loopholes. Yeah, Sante Kimes, Antonio. Yeah, she's another one. About these sociopathic people, Shante Kimes, et cetera. I think these specific people are born this way. They're grifting criminal ways or from a very young age. Well, that's that's definitely the case with the Oppelt brothers. They've been grifting and conning since they were born, <laughs> since they were children, really, I think. And, you know, then, of course, people came to court and argued with a straight face that they were poor and intellectually deficient when they were children. Therefore, they were forced to do, they, he was forced to rape somebody with a gang rape and, and take her out to the desert and leave her there because, you know, he's intellectually deficient. He was forced, his intellectually de intellectual deficiency forced him to then come back and steal her stuff. Come on. You know, he's, what was just so disgusting about that is that now you're linking people that, you know, somebody who's bagging your groceries with Down syndrome, who's somebody that could be premeditating to slit your throat for money. You're linking them together both ways. It goes both ways. Assholes. It's disgusting. I think people should be more concerned about charlatans and grifters because we never actually know how far some people, these people are willing to go to keep the grift going and getting what they want. Right? Yep. I mean, <sighs> I certainly know that the hard way. And then try after that, trusting men. <laughs> Luckily, I married somebody who was just so freaking transparent that you can't help but trust him. <laughs> my ex wanted me to sign my will, leaving everything to him. I was going in for surgery. It scared me shitless. Wow. Well, that the, the fact that that scared you is a big of, bit of a warning sign. So, yeah, that's how they got arrested. They were tried separately, two separate trials. I testified at both of them. Uh, I think I've talked about this, too, speaking of appeal things. You know, they will appeal on everything. And Charlie Adelson's appellate attorney will do this. They will appeal on every little thing, whether they, they they're just hoping that they can slip through some sort of loophole. That's it. It's not, it's not that they're looking for mistakes. It's not that they're looking for errors in a trial. It's that they're looking for loopholes and technicalities, in my experience, especially as it goes down the road. I mean, there are some trials. There are some mistakes in some trials and that sort of thing. Um, and it's good when they catch those. That's not my experience, having gone through this. Example, right before we went to trial, the Arizona Victims Bill of Rights passed. It allowed victims to stay in the courtroom. Once you're deemed a victim in that system, you can testify, then stay in the courtroom, and then retestify. What was happening is that before that passed, is that defense attorneys were putting family members on their witness list, which would keep them out of the entire proceedings during the prosecution's case, because they're saying, well, we're going to call them in our case. So they can't be privy to any of this testimony until their testimony, they would have absolutely no intention. You, you saw in Charlie's trial, they had like a hundred people on the witness list and they called what two. So they'll give these lengthy witness lists. It's strategy, but they would strategize to keep victims families out of the courtroom with no intention of ever calling them as a witness. But as long as they were listed on that list, um, they couldn't watch the proceedings. So the Arizona, you know, the v victim's bill of rights combated that by saying you can't play that game just to keep victims out of the courtroom because they don't want juries to be sympathetic 
to the victim. So that was passed shortly before we went to trial. So some people that I know were not able to sit in the courtroom for that reason um, during, you know, their murder cases of their loved one. So I testified once. I was called back a couple of times, I think, to clarify things. In I think in Michael's trial that happened. And that was one of the first things they appealed on was that. Even though they knew darn well that it was legal for me to do that, they still put together an appeal, we, which we paid for. We paid for their time to do that, to put together an appeal, to assemble the appellate, you know, court, the, you know, the group of judges that listens to appeals and decides on it, you know, to have the whole proceeding, to go through the whole thing. We pay for that knowing full well that that was legal for me to sit in that. That was an appeal that they launched. So that's what I mean. Like they're just looking for any kind of, and hoping that they'll get a Sylvia Ariano, a biased judge, who's not going to be a jury. It's not going to be a panel. It's going to be one judge. They're hoping that if they keep throwing this stuff out there, throwing this stuff against the wall, they'll get somebody who also has an agenda, like they have an agenda. And that they will use this murderer to fulfill that agenda. And it succeed, It worked in our case with Sylvia Ariano. It was terrifying. It was the scariest part of the entire thing for me was that appeal with Sylvia Ariano and to see how biased the system was toward these killers. <clears throat> Do you have any, did you have any eye contact with any of them? Anka, Michael, Rudy. Um, I walked up to them at the funeral. I think I was starting to tell that and I side sidetracked. They were all sitting in a row. And when I got there, cause I got there late because I, there was going to be a meeting with them beforehand. And I knew I had, I was going to lose my shit if I, because I was still kind of combating my own family with this. Like they did it, they did it, they did it, they did it. And they were more like, well, we have to have an open mind. They haven't been arrested yet. I mean, it was pure hell for me because I knew, you know, and I, I still didn't believe they did it themselves, but I, I knew that they were behind it. And so I walked up to each of them in a row and shook their hands. And the only one that made eye contact with me was Anka. The, the brothers did, wouldn't look at me. But I did that purposely for just for my own head, because I wanted to telegraph to them. I know you did this. You're not getting away with this. And so I walked up to each of them. Boom, boom, boom. And did that before the um, funeral. Let's see. Is the podcast more thorough than the American Monster special? I think it is. Um. I think it is more thorough. It's more thorough in, in a way that I appreciate and that it goes more into Cindy and her background and her personality and um, her vulnerability. So yes, you know, it's different in that it's not um, pictures, you know, but I think, um, I think in many ways it is more thorough, yeah. It's, it's a really, bye, Jamie. Thanks for joining. Yeah, I was controlled with my emotions for sure. <laughs> I've had to be, you know, I've, it, I had to sit in a courtroom, many courtrooms on this. Um, so yeah, I've had to be, be controlled. It's disgusting seeing people use learning disabilities or some mental health concerns for millions of good humans live and function with as excuses for violence, for crimes, for murders. It is disgusting. And, you know, especially since, um, you know, the Supreme Court ruled that we cannot execute the intellectually disabled. Ooh, there's a huge loophole we can throw everybody into. And the Oppelt brothers were like right at the top of the list. Thank you for that. I hope, um, I hope my sister is proud of me. The best sister and advocate she could have ever had. 
Well, I've certainly been fighting for a lot of years for most of my adult life um, on her for her benefit. I have been fighting. See, this is what people don't get. It's hard enough getting guilty murderers convicted. Look at how long it's taken for the Adelsons. It is not an easy process convicting obviously guilty murderers. There are so much protections for them. But then add the death penalty into it, and it's very hard to keep them in prison. Because now you're opening up a whole other can of worms and agendas for people. Um, that the a, a death row inmate has a much likelier uh, possibility of being released from prison than a, than a murderer in for life, for sure, because they get the death row inmates get the best of the best legal assistance for free. Like what Charlie Adelson is going to be paying for a death row inmate would get for free. And I guarantee you his appellate attorney um, does death row appeals inmates. He's not doing it for free, but that inmate isn't having to pay him because it's the death penalty. Charlie will pay for this level of diligence and loopholing and needle haystacking and all of that because he has money and he'll waste all of his money on appeals. He'll never get out of prison, but they'll be searching and searching and searching and they'll appeal on all kinds of minuscule bullshit for him because he can pay for that level of diligence. Most people can't pay for that. Um, you know, how many needle, how many haystacks can we build to find a needle in it? Um, so buckle up. That's happening. If I was the Markells, and I suspect they're wise enough to do this, I wouldn't pay attention to that because most of them are futile and it's hard. I don't pay attention to it. You know, I went to a parents and murder children group meeting and I saw these people and right after within the months of Cindy being killed. And, and I saw these people saying, you know, I can never have my life back until he's executed. And I'm like, I can't do that. That's not a life I'm going to have. So I never went back. And I mean, I get that, that, that is a consequence of this happening in your life. I, I get that. It's just, that's not a person, a life I wanted to live. So I, I decided that I don't follow the appeals closely. I know there's one going on right now. I mean, I have told, I have a lawyer, a victim lawyer that's appointed to me and an advocate. And I've told them like, I don't want the letter sent to my house anymore. I would get monthly letters. I don't even want to pull that out of my mailbox. You know, a lot of times it's like, there's nothing new on the appeals process, but 30 years of getting a letter every month, you know, I don't need that. And so I've just told them, let me know if there's something I absolutely have to know. Let me know if there's something I have to be involved with. And I get a call once or twice a year. Um, most recently, you know, the update I got was that, and I've shared this before, um, Michael Appel, who's the only one that's still alive, he's in death row. He, um, he's now, and I say he loosely because it's not him, it's his attorneys come up with these new stories and preposterous schemes and how can we, I mean, they're scheming just like the murderers are scheming. They're scheming how to get them off death row. And his latest one is that, you know, the story he's been telling for 35 years is not accurate. That in reality, he caught her in bed with another man, I think is what it is. And then he just lost it and killed her there in the apartment and then dumped her body. The reason he's telling, the reason they are, it's not him, his attorneys have concocted that story. These do-gooding death row appeal attorneys have concocted that new story where they're now blaming her for being murdered because he caught her in bed with another man is because they're trying to get the death penalty off the table. So that takes off the pecuniary gain, which is he did it for money, and the first degree murder, because it looks like now it's a crime of passion. So that's the latest that he's trying to appeal on. Like, okay, that didn't work, that didn't work, that didn't work. Let's come up with a whole new story and see if anybody will buy that and see if we can find another biased judge to want to take somebody off death row that they're willing to overlook 35 years of evidence. When here's the thing, <laughs> when that 
dies, which it will, there, that will, will not be successful. But again, we are paying for that. We're paying for that appeal to be launched as taxpayers, federal dollars. Our tax dollars are going to that appeal being launched and everybody that's preparing it and everybody that's going to hear it, we're paying their salaries. When that is unsuccessful, where he's now admitting that he did it, but is a crime of passion, when that's unsuccessful, he's going to loop right back to, oh yeah, well, anyway, I didn't do it. And there's no accountability. There's no, well, yesterday you actually said that you did. So no, you they won't even consider that because now this is a whole new appeal that like we're going to, oops, that, that actually didn't happen. Oh, forget that. Wipe the slate clean. That's the appeals process. So yeah, this is why I don't pay attention to it. This is why you could go crazy because it's bad enough that learned, educated people are launching this bullshit for the worst of the worst of our world to, to be not held, held accountable. It's bad enough, but it's even worse that we're paying the millions of dollars to do it out of our pockets, out of our taxes. So that is my soapbox on that. It seems this pendulum has swung too far for the perpetrators. The victims and their loved ones are put through endless trauma in the name of the perpetrator's rights. Yep. That happens with the death penalty. It's going to be interesting with Charlie Adelson because, because of his money and likely with Donna too, they're going to be kind of treated similarly like death row inmates because they're going to pay for high level appellate attorneys fighting for them and fighting and they got nothing else to do with their time. So they're going to be, I mean, we saw it with Charlie's defense, right? The preposterous um, extortion defense. So he's got nothing to do, but scheme and come up with like, Oh, let me look at it this way. Let's look at it this way. Let's plug this hole. Let's, you know, he's got nothing but time and he will be paying people to argue that for him. So there'll be endless arguments. They will turn this whole thing inside out. He'll abandon the extortion. He'll blame Dan. He will probably say something about how Dan provoked him. There might be a self-defense that arises at some point. I mean, it's just insane. Like if that doesn't work, let's try this. If that doesn't like work, let's try that. This is what they will do. This is what that appellate attorney will do for Charlie. And he will spend all of his money doing it. And this guy will argue this bullshit with a straight face. So like, I just hope, <laughs> you know, the Markells don't sit in those courtrooms and have to listen to this crap and stuff like I had to, because it was a whole new sentencing hearing. Um, you know, I had to go to that, but most of these, most of these appeals are done behind closed doors and that's why I can avoid them. And I do avoid them. <laughs> And, you know, some things need to be brought to my attention. Some things I have to speak out on. I have to give an opinion on. I'm asked to weigh in on things like that. But other than that, I don't want to know. And I and I made the decision long ago that Michael Appel's probably never going to be executed. So why be attached to that? You know, let him live out his life in prison and die in prison like his brother did and be done with it. I've never felt like I needed to go see his execution. I've never felt a bloodthirsty thing for him. I've never, I just want him to disappear. Now there's a whole other thing where they have online websites that ring it, read like singles ads. I think Rudy's might still be up there. Even after he was released from death row, his, website still remained on there as if he was a death row inmate, which gets them a lot of Lonely Hearts Club people that write them letters. And, you know, I mean, what they more, want more than anything is attention. And it's a way that they can get attention and uh, money. People send them money. And Michael Appelt got married in prison and then divorced. And that bitch reached out to me on my blog. wanting my sympathy. And I'm like, okay, that's a bridge too far for me. That's just a bridge too far for me. You married him 
after he was convicted on death row, you were championing for him like he was innocent then. And then, oops, you got burned. What? He was cheating on you with another pen pal. And she reached out to me and I was like, yeah, no, we're not going to become BFFs. <laughs> Sorry. Anyway. Any other questions? There is a financial aspect of Dan Markell murder. You better believe there is. And I think, talking about Dan Markell murder, I think that that financial aspect has been underplayed because I think that is a major piece. It's just a hunch. I think it's a major piece of how they convinced Wendy to get on board. I don't think Wendy immediately would be like, oh yeah, let's kill Dan. Ooh. You know, I, you know, it's more complicated for her because she's got her kids, right? So I think it was easy for um, Donna and Charlie to come up with that. But for Wendy, I think they might have had to do a little more convincing. And I think Donna used finances. Look how much better your life is going to be, Wendy. You're going to get this life insurance. The kids are going to get covered with the Social Security. You're going to get this. You're going to get all these things you've been fighting for in court. You're going to get, he, gonna, you know, and yes, I think Wendy's that superficial. And I think that might have been the... Um, deciding factor for Wendy of like the financial relief that she would get with Dan being dead. Alaska. Thank you, Kathy. So sorry we weren't there as an online community to support you then. I can't imagine going through even a fraction of what you've had to endure. You're mighty strong. Thank you. <laughs> you missed the Wendy impression. Let me see if I can muster it up for you. Ugh. She's the worst. Yeah, you know how convincing Donna is. Yep, Donna is very convincing. And I think she is that superficial. Yeah, Allison, you're right. Wendy repeatedly uh, called about Dan's life insurance in the days after his death, and she tried to get her grubby little hands on the GoFundMe too. So I think the money was a big motivator for, um, for Wendy. I do. Yeah, Carl Steinbeck, I was listening to him the other day too. Love Carl. Carl Steinbeck was speaking of that the other day. Absolutely, Wendy was convinced life was, would be easy. Then when she isn't doing what they want, they get crazy. Yeah. Hi, Private Eye Posse. I'm glad you listened to the podcast. I thought it was good too. And if anybody's so inclined, show these guys some love. I, Like I said, I joined their Patreon. I'm going to start listening to their podcast. And they, they cover lesser known cases. And she was really surprised that she goes, I'm sure you get approached all the time by podcasts about your case. And I'm like, actually, no, you're the first one. <laughs> Another podcast did um, Cindy's case to women. But I don't remember the name of it. I found it a while back, but they never approached me. Um, so, yeah, I told her, um, not really. But, yeah, they cover lesser known cases. Um, and another way that you can support them is just by giving them a review at the place that you listen to the podcast. Just, you know, making a comment and giving them a review that I need to do today, too. So, Let's see. I'm convinced the Adelson family is neck deep in financial misdeeds. And I believe it's another reason Rashbaum is first chair for all of them. Lily, you are right in line with my husband. He thinks that their financial crimes are much more extensive than what we've seen and tax and otherwise. And, um, and that Rashbaum is in deep with that too. I can't stand him now. I just, I, I was so neutral on him during Charlie's trial. And now, yeah, you know how I feel about Rashbaugh. Donna and Charlie's phone calls about how Wendy hit the lottery. She's so stupid not to be marrying the other guy. Dave is so disgusting. Yeah. Yeah, they were not making all that money from dental work. Yep. And that might be something that, you know, comes out more at some point. But, you know, whatever money they do have that do doesn't go to rash bomb and other dumb Josh Dubin type people um, is going to be spent on appellate attorneys. And here they did all this for those for Dan's boys who will, will not see a dime. 
all that money. Well, Wendy's, I'm sure, going to hold on to as much as she can of her own money and wall her money off. Um, but how sad. But see, they never did it for the boys. They did it for Donna. They All of this was done for Donna. And then Wendy was like, oh, okay, sure, mom, you know, makes my life easier. And, you know, I can't stand them anyway. And let's stick it to those Markels. Yeah, despite already being financially comfortable, the Adelsons were greedy for more. Yep. Yeah, I wish we had a way to know the extent of what Charlie did overseas. I think a lot of disgusting crimes over there as well, in my opinion. Yeah, I think, and I also think he was over there looking for um, lifestyle choices. If they had evidence, we'd already be at the airport and he knew exactly where they they would be going. I think he set all that up. Like if, if you know, heat starts coming on us, we're going to go to Vietnam and I've already scoped it out, mom. This is where we're going to live. This is the lifestyle. There's no extradition. You know, I think he had that all well mapped out and he just was arrogant and um, I'm glad he was because he didn't get on, didn't go to the airport in time. Yeah. Wendy de denying going on Trescott is the clincher for me. Yeah. It's huge. Well, and it's not just that she denied it, Sully. It's that she's told so many different stories about it. And the story that she tells, which Charlie keeps repeating is 100% refuted by the evidence because she tell well, she's told different versions of it, but she tells that she was not able to turn on Trescott, and that is not where the crime scene tape was. So if she went up to the crime scene tape and saw the patrol car there and saw the officer, she drove about a half mile at least down Pres Trescott to get to the tri crime scene tape. She did not, was not unable to enter Trescott Drive. That is not where the crime scene tape was. So it's not so much that she's, that she went to the crime scene. It's that she's lying about it repeatedly because she thinks that makes her look better because if she was unable to turn onto Trescott, she couldn't see the house. So she could make up the story about a fallen tree or it was just a generic thing or the road was just closed. I don't know why. Maybe it was flooded. I don't know why, whatever. But if she actually admits to going up to the crime scene tape, she has to admit that she saw the house and she's smart enough to know she does not have a reason for not reacting to that and not calling about the kids and not, you know, because the cars were in the freaking driveway of the house. And I mean, I went up to where that crime scene tape was and it's very visible. The house in the driveway is very visible from where the crime scene tape was. So it's not so much that she even, I mean, it's in addition to her cruising the crime scene. It's her lying about it repeatedly. And what I'm curious about, and this is a question for Carl Steinbeck is, you know, she's got immunity. So she feels emboldened to go into court and make up different stories each time she testifies, you know, based on her whatever of that moment. But can that inconsistency somehow come in in a cross-examination, either in her trial or Donna's trial? I don't know. The perjury is documented. Two things cannot be true in her testimony. That's right. Yeah, you're right, La Mesa. Um, the only... One of the only times I heard remorse from Charlie was him repeating over and over. He should have listened to his gut and left the country. Yep. Sucks to be you, Charlie. Sucks to be you. The arrogance. And did you guys listen to when I did that reading from Epstein's book about his arrest? It's very satisfying. Anyway, we're on to Adelson. I don't know if you guys... Um, caught that I'm not going to be going down for jury selection now as I had planned because it's a whole week and jury selection um, just to probably take a couple days and then there'll be like a lull but the lull will be like five days and I just it's not worth it to me to and I, I really couldn't see much of anything during jury selection anyway other than you know eyeballing potential jurors that didn't get picked um you know, the main thing is to watch the jury once they're seated. So I'm going the 6th. I check in on the 6th and the trial starts on the 7th. And I don't need to do that more orientation because I know where to park. I know how to get in there. I know the 
the rules, you know, now I, I don't feel like I need to get there super days early to kind of scope out the scene. I've already done that. And I will sit on my same perch and watch that jury just like I did for Charlie's trial. And, but the only difference of this time is I'm going to report live. Remember it took me so long to go on live, like months before I would try to go on a live. So I was intimidated by it, but it's going to streamline the whole thing because what I did last time was I would go shove some food in my mouth. I always brought my lunch in my backpack and then make a video no, I did the video and then I ate my lunch. Anyway, it doesn't matter. Anyway, I'll, um, you know, and then I took forever to upload the video. It took so long because my videos were like a half hour long and then I'd have to upload the video and stuff. But this way I can go boom, right on live. And I, and now that I'm intermittent fasting, I won't be eating lunch. So I won't miss my lunch because <laughs> I know people ate it and when I ate on camera one time. So yeah, you think my new schedule sounds like the I know, I hope nothing else changes with those dates, but I specifically picked uh, a place to stay that I could jimmy around the dates because some of those um, Airbnbs, you only have 45, 48 hours from the time you make the booking to make any changes. So you're screwed, you know? And I mean, you could be liable for the whole amount of it. So anyway, um, you know, I have... I have wiggle room. I don't think that they're going to change these dates now. They have plenty of time pre to prepare. Judge um, Everett is like really pretty rigid with the schedule. And like they have to lock down their schedules way in advance. And this is going to take a little while, this trial. So I don't think, you know, barring something emergency happening or whatever. Let's hope Rash Bomb doesn't break his foot again. Anyway, so... Um, yeah, going live will be great because ask questions. Yeah. And I'll just have to figure out the, I mean, I might be able to figure out, I might bring my little tripod in my, I'll have to figure out the logistics of it because it's better to go on live. The camera is better on my phone. So if I can go on live with the phone, um, then I can also be on the laptop where my notes will be at the same time. So So that's how I'll do it. I'll go live at lunch and then I'll go live at the end of the day, depending on what happens at the end of the day. You know, if I just go back to the Airbnb, um, you know, sometimes there's like a little, little socializing at the end of the day. So, I'll, but I will go live to talk about the um, second half of the day at the end of the day. And, you know, what I do is give, you know, some sort of behind the scenes color commentary that you don't see on the cameras. Obviously, I'll be watching the jury, you know, making very generic observations about demographics about them. You know, their general age range as I see it, um, gender, things like that. How they're interacting with each other, how they look, you know, obviously I don't give names and I'm sort of cloak the numbers. I don't give their juror numbers. I just make up nicknames for them to make it as generic as possible. But really what I'm observing is behavior and do they make eye contact? Are they making eye contact with the defendant? Are they interacting with each other? You know, you want a cohesive jury that are bonded with each other. Um, are there any weird outliers like businessman was last time? Any strange behavior sticking out, you know, or how focused are they or people falling asleep, things like that. Are, are the um, are the kind of observations that I make back to my psych nursing days? All we do was observe and document, observe and document behavior. So that's kind of how I do it. So I'll be doing that as well as any like behind the scenes stuff, like um, what's happening in the hallways and you know who's sitting on the witness bench. Because what's wild is if you go out on a break and you go to the bathroom, there's this long hallway with these benches all the way down the wall. The next witnesses are sitting out there. So, I mean, I walked right past Wendy with her, I called her the bulldog, the, um, it was her victim advocate, I guess, the blonde curly haired lady, you know, hovering over her, but you know, Jeff Lacasse was sitting out there, you know, you go out to go to the bathroom. It's like, you're doing a double take. It's like, Oh, hi, Jeff Lacasse. Oh, there's Wendy, you know? So, it's just, you know, I'll give little little scoopage on that too. Let's see. 
She told lie and had to stick with it, but it led to other lies. Also, I'd like to know why she asked the detective if she was a suspect. Did she ask that before they told her what happened? Yeah, Jenny, I'm not really sure that the sequence of that, that's a good question. I would love to go to the trial, but have to save up PTO and take off work, et cetera. You know, Colleen, it's almost better watching the trial at home for these reasons. Um, you get, you just get a lot more information when you're watching it. Like if it's being covered live, which this one will, you get better views of the witness and the defendant. You're going to get, I'm going to only be seeing Donna from the back. You're going to be watching her face, you know, because the camera's shining on her face. You get the legal commentary happening, you know, at the moment. Um, there's just a lot of things. And and like Fancy Fiction and I talked about, there's something about being there in person that it's very ordinary. It's it's It loses an intensity in person. Um it's hard to explain that, but it's, she had this exact same impression. You know, I go for my personal reasons to be there in person. I went to Charlie's trial simply because I was scared shitless about them doing jury tampering. I don't feel that way about Donna's trial as if I'm anybody, I'm just a nobody, but I'm like, somebody needs to be in that courtroom holding the high watch over that jury to, to just let it be known that they're being watched. I don't know. I just felt so strongly. And I'd be, it'd be curious if they tried to do something, you know, Charlie, Donna, whatever. But I mean, the only people on the outside now are Harvey and Wendy and Wendy's divorced herself from the whole thing. I think for the most part, and Harvey doesn't have the balls to put something like that together on his own. Was there enough space in the court for everyone who wanted to be present? Yes, there was, including the biggest day was Charlie's direct examination, which of course you saw how that cleared out after lunch because it was so incredibly bizarre and boring and agitating all at the same time. Um, but yeah, there was plenty of room for people to be um, in the courtroom uh, for sure. Even that day. There, there wasn't anybody, you know, people are saying that they think it's going to be more for Donna's. I don't think there'll be more turnout for Donna than there was for Charlie at all. Wendy's might be different. A Wendy trial would probably be different, but I don't think there's going to be some, you know, major flood of people wanting to come see Donna Adelson convicted, partly because, you know, everybody watching this, including Carl, I was listening to, couple nights ago, it's a foregone conclusion. You know, I mean, it's, there's not much drama, like, oh, is she going to be convicted or not? Because, you know, look what happened with Charlie. Look how handily they convicted him in a three hour less deliberation. And the witness, the evidence is basically the same, but in my opinion, stronger against Donna. Is Fancy planning on going again also? I believe she is. I don't know how much, but, you know, she's got connections. She used to live in Tallahassee. She's got connections there. So I believe she is um, going to be coming at least for part of the trial. I can't, I also can't believe a wait for Donna to be on the stand, just alienate the jury one by one, I know. Because she's not as sophisticated as Charlie is of being an actor. She's she's older and you know you lose a lot of your composure i know this when you get older there's more kind of impulsivity oh my god yeah right um oh wait a minute somebody Har harvey couldn't even handle leaving the airport all by himself when tana's arrest yeah right and of course she was like Worried about him getting an Uber and how he's going to get home. Oh, my God. Harvey the baby. Kathy mentioned what a toll the Adelson Markell convictions might possibly take on people. This case has permanently affected me and continues to. My prayers go out to Ruth and Phil. I just want to remind everybody that speaking of Ruth, I don't have the book right next to me, but 
uh, tomorrow evening at seven, we're doing our first in a series of three discussions on Ruth's book, The Unveiling. And um, you don't have to have read the book to come. We're going to be reading excerpts from it. And she actually sent me something that she once read, which I'm not sure how it relates to the book in terms of like her writing process. It's an essay. And um, if, I don't know if she wrote it before or after. I haven't gotten the details on it, but she sent it to me. So I'm going to be reading that. It's like a three-page essay about grief and um, specifically her grief. And um, other people are going to be um, Allison, for one, joining to um, to read. And um, and then we're going to have a discussion about that the first section of the book. So her book is in three sections and we're just covering the first section tomorrow. So we have three scheduled and Ruth has been writing me a lot about it. She's asked me a lot of questions about it. And um, I don't know that she's going to be present watching it live, but I'm sending her the link. And she asked if it was going to be available after that to watch. So she will eventually watch it, including reading your comments in the chat. So, um, just know that, you know, that'd be a great place for you to send any remarks to Ruth and through the chat at these um, book events that we're going to have starting tomorrow. And Judy, the YouTube lawyer, is co-hosting it with me. So um, that's exciting. So Judy will be with us tomorrow night as well. So anyway, we went all around the horn today. If there's any more questions on the um, podcast or anything, let me know. Let me see. Here's a question. Oh, my daily intermittent fasting time frame is. I'm kind of making it up as I go along, but I'm kind of doing 18-6, be rabbit. So I'm doing 18 um, fasting hours in a day in six window of eating right now. So I'm already feeling better. My energy is better my, um, definitely better. I got on the rowing machine this morning and, um, I feel so much better on intermittent fasting, you guys. And I'm looking forward to, you know, editing my body <laughs> and just, it really brings down inflammation. Cause what, what occurred to me, you know, I think I talked about this eye thing I was having. Somebody thought I had a black eye in one of the lives or one of the videos I made because it was so inflamed. But I've also been, you may have noticed when I do, I have makeup on today, but when I've done videos without makeup on, I've been having rosacea on my cheeks. And I did some research and those two things are related. It's just another extension of the rosacea on my eyelid. So I'm like, oh, that makes sense. So the intermittent fasting is going to help with that because it's just a lot of inflammation. That's one of the things intermittent fasting really helps you with. And it's the glutathione that it, anyway, it doesn't matter. We could do a whole talk on that. Maybe we do well sometime because I feel so much better when I am doing intermittent fasting and I've only been doing it now for a few days. I'm back on it and I already feel so much better. Um, so yeah. Yes. Yay to Judy. The judge already admonished Donna for her facial expressions and outbursts. I know. Isn't that awesome? He, he doesn't mess around. 18.6 is excellent. Oh, good, Sully, you do that too. Yeah, that's what I did before I, I, I lost weight. I just, you know, it's it's just, it's very compatible. And somebody said um, that when they lost their father, one of you guys said that, that you kind of went off the intermittent fasting wagon. And that, that's a line of demarcation for me too, when my dad got sick and died and it's just everything just kind of went out the window. So uh, all of a sudden it just occurred to me like, duh, I need to get back on that. And it's like, it's weird. Those people that um, are on it are going to be re relating to this is that I remember when I shifted from like comfort eating to comfort fasting, if that makes any sense, because I started to feel so good during my fasting windows that it was like, I was more excited to get back into my fasting window to just get that feeling. Um, I don't know if it's endorphins or whatever happens during that, that it, it would be like, oh, now I'm back in my fasting window. Like I feel physically, mentally better, you know? And um, anyway, so that 
that's sort of a, a was unexpected side effect of this. So yeah, I was thinking about that going to Tallahassee, that I'm going to be doing my intermittent fasting. So I don't have to worry about lunch because I'll just set up my fasting window to cover lunch. So that's not a complication for doing my lives on the lunch break. My focus, entire attention will be on doing my live during the lunch break. And I'm not going to have to, I'm not going to have a conflict of like going to lunch with everybody because I won't be eating lunch anyway. So it was just like, oh, that's going to make it so much easier for me. Oh, you're sweet for asking about my bulbs. Oh my God. My bulbs are amazing. I'm up at the lake house right now. And um, I haven't been physically down there since I got up yesterday, but um, I can see them from, from up here. And uh, I have daffodils everywhere. You can't put tulips in up here because the squirrels and rabbits and stuff will eat tulip bulbs, but they won't touch daffodils or hyacinths. So I have those everywhere. So I have dozens and dozens coming up right now. And um, it's exciting <laughs> to see that. And I'm planning, my husband comes up tomorrow and um, we have this new kid that we found, you know, we're out in the middle of nowhere. So finding people to like come here and work with us, who's going to dig me a bed and do some other kind of landscaping cleanup there for us. Cause it's also the hauling away of stuff. And anyway, so um, he's going to dig me a Dahlia bed. So let's see, how's it affecting my sleeping? You know, uh, sleeping is, has been an issue for me and um Anyway, it's much better. It, it affects everything and it, it affects my sleep. So my sleeping is better. I, you know, I still have some issues with sleeping, but I didn't my whole life, but post-menopause sleeping. <coughs> Between what hours do you eat? It depends on when I break my fast. So today it's 117. I'm going to break it at two. So between like two and eight is when I'll eat. So I can eat a couple meals during then. You can eat whatever you want during your um, during your window of eating, but it's the closing of it. That's important. You know, like, okay. I mean, last night, oh my God, I was watching TV and I was really wanting a snack, but it's like, no, nope, drink some water. Your window's closed. So it's like not even an option. And, um, you know, at the beginning that happens, but then it starts snowballing in the other direction where you're like, oh, I'm in my fasting window. Oh my God, I feel so much better. And then also you, um, Oh, you get that about the comfort fasting. And, you know, I'm a foodie. I'm a person who loves to eat. So it's really bizarre that I would have like a comfort family. And I've come from like a whole family of comfort eating. So, um, you know, we, we, we got our overweightness fair and square <laughs> also in our genes. But so it's, it's funny how that starts to kind of overtake, you know, that comfort fasting where it's like, oh, it feels just so good to be resting and like feeling that mental clarity that comes up and all that stuff that comes with fasting. And also like I get into that, like at night, like, all oh, right, I want a snack. I want to, you know, all that kind of like late night munchy kind of thing. And I just tell myself in the morning, you're not going to be hungry at all. And I wake up in the morning and it's all gone. So it's just, it's fascinating to watch. Um, do you drink anything other than water? Um, coffee. Black coffee. That's it. Water and black coffee. That's what I drink. And then I'm doing some other, um, some other things to support, you know, my liver and things like that during this process as I'm supporting my body in new ways. So yeah, well, maybe we'll have a whole discussion, um, on intermittent fasting and that sort of thing. Cause it's, it's, and I use an app cause that just sort of helps me ground, you know, with an app of when I open and close my window, that's all that's really basically on the app. The other thing that happens is that when you know you have a narrow window and you only have so much appetite or room for eating, you know, at a, any given time, I'm much more particular about what I eat in my window because it's like, I don't want to waste my eating window on crap. You know, I want to, I want to, if I'm going to be eating and getting full from food, I want it to be, I'm just better about my choices during the window. And let me tell you, when we went down to Rancho La Puerta, two things happened, one for my husband, one for me. Um, sugar just sort of dropped off because down there you don't really eat any refined sugar at all. And I came home and I'm like, I don't have sugar cravings anymore. Like 
I'm looking at a big bowl of candy over there. It's just not, it's not something that I'm resisting because it's like, I'd rather eat an orange, you know? So that changed just sort of organically. And my husband really, really changed his relationship with food. You know, he grew up in poverty and much of his childhood in poverty and six kids and a mentally ill mother and a dead dad. And they did not literally did not have enough food, you know, many years of his growing up. So it's kind of led to some behaviors in him um, that he's just, he said that we went to this silent dinner that was fantastic. You know, that you, everybody eats in silence. There was maybe 15 of us there or something, eat a four course meal in silence. And that silent dinner, that one night transformed my husband with his eating and his style of eating where he put the fork down between his bites and stuff. And he does that now where he's now, instead of just inhaling food, you know, when you grew up in poverty and there wasn't enough food, when it was there, you're just inhaling it. And he used to do that, you know, and, um, and now he's pacing himself and realizing he stops eating when he's not hungry. I've, I've been married to him almost 10 years and I've never seen him do that until the last few months. So like he dropped a, like 12 pounds, like as soon as we get back, but he's a man with a metabolism. <laughs> he eats so much more than me, but I'm the one that's, you know, puts on weight. But anyway, we're, we're on our own trajectories. So <laughs> my husband wants to know if John would like to start a support group for husband whose wives are preoccupied by the Adelson cases. That's funny. Cause he'll say, he knows a lot about the case, but um, he'll say, um, okay, enough Adelson talk. I can't, but then after I haven't talked about it in a while, he'll say, so anything new on the Adelson's? <laughs> oh. Cellular uh, uh, autophagy. Is that how you say that? Sully? Yes. And how I've noticed that autoph autophagy, autophagy, <laughs> I think it's autophagy. Um, I'll tell you a very unexpected uh, result of intermittent fasting for me. And um, I used to have very, very I have struggled with very, very dry, crusty heels, you know, where they crack and, you know, they got the calluses and you have to like sand them down and all that kind of stuff, you know, partially because I like to be barefoot a lot and stuff, but like part of it's just genetic. When I went on intermittent fasting the last time, when I had this really long stretch of it and I did really well, my feet turned into like soft as a baby's butt. And I'm like, how is this happening? And I realized it's the intermittent fasting is doing that. It was really so remarkable for me to see that. Cause I'm like, if it's doing that to my calloused heels on the outside, what is it doing to my body on the inside? It was very reinforcing. Yeah. You have the tough heels. Well, autophagy. Okay. Thanks, Sully. Autophagy. Autophagy. Is that the way I'm saying it right? Autophagy. Yeah, that was really interesting about the heels. And it wasn't something that I in any way expected. And all of a sudden I noticed it. And really the absolute only thing that I was doing differently was intermittent fasting. And I mean, that was a huge, huge change of that. I was surprised how many details John knows about the Adelson case. Top cat. I know he, he I've subjected him to a lot of it. It was surprising, though, how much he remembered about it. Um, anyway, I'm going to sign off here in a minute. This has been a long live and get ready to, to close my window, open my window. And my husband is trying to, oh, he's at a doctor's appointment and he wants he wants to chat. Um, any other Okay. Thanks, Sully. Any other questions, issues? <laughs> Kevin, you invented a special tool for dealing with dead skin on the heels. Take it on Shark Tank. Yeah, great to see you guys in here. The 108 people that are in here. Thanks for stopping by. Oh, thank you, Annie, Joe, B Rabbit, La Mesa, Sully, Antonio. Antonio, you've been here through the whole thing. 
you in Naples, Florida. Thank you, Colleen. Thanks for sharing, everybody. Yeah, if you get a chance, go give them some love over there on the um, True Crime Couple podcast just by, you know, making a review or, or at, at the um, place where you listen to it and uh, following them or if you're so inclined. A top. Autophagy. Okay, there we go. Autophagy. It's funny how when you read something, you don't know if you're saying it right. I mostly enjoy being fit for the fashion public feet. I enjoy being fit in shape. I get similar attention as I did from years. I bet you do, Antonio. I bet you're quite the little stylish hottie out there. All right, guys. Well, it looks like we kind of covered everything today. So I'll be seeing whoever wants to show up tomorrow for the book club. Joining me, Judy, Allison, sharing, and yourselves sharing, and uh, and knowing that Ruth will be watching either tomorrow night or in the future and being able to see all your commentary and, and thoughtful remarks about her book. And have a great day, everybody. Tomorrow is 7 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. So thanks for stopping by everybody and um, tomorrow night. And then Saturday is our last anxiety recovery class in that series. And I'm bringing my friend Rini Allen in. She's going to be leading you through some stuff that she does in her amazing space in Maine. And um, so anybody that wants to continue with that kind of work, I'll be passing the baton over to Rini. And so that's on Saturday at 11. So that's what's up. And Antonio, I will put a picture of my new desk once it gets installed up there. So anyway, love you guys. Thanks for being here. And um, see you tomorrow night. All right. Signing off a coffee talk. Okay. Bye for now. <laughs>